good morning. Uh, welcome to the Jesus Movement Live. Uh, today we continue on with our new series from the book of Job. Uh, this is lesson uh, number two or sermon number two or teaching number two, whatever you'd like it to be. Uh, it's called Job Speaks to His Three Friends. And it's actually, as this subtitle says, a discussion of suffering. And so his friends come to spend some time with him because they hear of his plight. And yet when we go into chapter 3, as we looked at today, you find that his suffering has had a profound effect on how he thinks and how he feels. So before we go into today's message, I've constructed this chart to show so that you can just absorb the scale of Job's journey. The book of Job is a big book. It has many components to it. And in fact, it has many chapters to it as well because they say a lot. But it's important that we understand that the purpose of this book in the canon of scripture is because it actually discusses the very plight of humanity. It's probably one of the most important and profound books in the Bible even though it may seem a bit miserable, because in fact reflects the reality of our earthly life. And so it's actually a story about God's sovereignty and humanity's struggle in the midst of suffering. One of the questions we often may be asked is why does God let us suffer if he is a good and sovereign God? And so there is a purpose to it, even though we may feel that it's not fair. And so in this book, I've broken this up and we have these five categories. The first category is an introduction to suffering. And you might notice all the way through it's suffering, 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 because this is the story. It's an introduction to suffering and it falls in chapter one and two. And this is what we spoke about last week. It's historical in nature because it gives us some information about where and when it occurred. We looked at Job's, pu Job's purity and prosperity because that's where he came from. We looked at the fact that Satan had a proposition and God gave him permission to strip everything away from Job, accepting his life. And so this maybe brings another question to mind. Why would God allow Satan to come against somebody who was an obedient and faithful servant. Thirdly, Satan's persecution and Job's patience through that, and Satan's persistence and God's permission, because there was not just one test, but there in fact was two tests. In the first test, everything was taken away from him, and in the second test, Satan inflicted him with boils or sores all over his body, and the Bible tells us they were so bad that Job got a piece of broken pottery and was trying to scrape these things from the surface of his skin. And of course, poverty and plagues become the outcome of Satan's actions because he took away everything that Job had. And in fact, one part of the story tells us that he actually set fire to all of his sheep and his uh, servants in one instance. And so this book here introduces us to what Satan can do and a very real picture that Satan roams the earth and the scriptures last week to say this as it does from Genesis when God casts him out. So this stage now we move to the discussion of suffering and so we're just starting into this area. It actually goes from chapter 3 to 31. Why? Because he has all of his friends who come about him and then a discourse starts between them. So this one is both theological and philosophical because the subject of God and the subject of why is this happening to me both come up. There's two perspectives that are given. The words of Job, which is the eyes on himself, which occurs in chapter three, and then the words of his three friends with a perspective of eyes on humanity occurs between chapters 4 and 31, so it goes for a long time. And this is where we get into that point where people start to perhaps use their worldly wisdom to speak into somebody's situation, perhaps we're understanding what's really happening. 
the fact that Satan is involved. Now the third section that we can break the book of Job into, between chapter 32 and 41, is the correction that occurs to us in suffering. It's both logical and it's revelational. Logical because the words of Elidu, one of the men who speak to him, with his eyes on God, and he's introduced later. So there's three men in the beginning, and there's a fourth who comes along. And that's in chapter 32 to 37. And then revelational words of God, with an emphasis on sovereignty, occur between chapter 38 and 41. Now the fourth component of this is submission under suffering. So we get to this point where we can't change the suffering, so we actually have to submit ourselves to it. And so this is this point where we, we call this a confessional. So chapter 42 verses 1 to 6 is Job's admission and Job's confession when he realises that all is not what he said it to be. And today, in fact, we'll actually come across some points where we realise that in Job's actions, in, right back in chapter 1, is he, for example, he puts a burnt offering for his children every time they have a feast because he's worried about their sin. And so this tells you that he's not secure, everything is not perfect, and he's trying to preempt things that haven't ha yet happened. And then finally, we look at restoration from suffering, which is the biblical story uh, between verses 7 and 17 of chapter 42. This goes back into a historical account because it's everything that's been restored back to Job that he lost in the beginning when he was introduced to suffering. So then we come across God's anger with the three friends because their story and the influence that they had on Job was not actually aligned with what was actually happening with God. And in the end, God blesses Job and his wealth and his Prosperity is restored to him, and in fact, the Bible tells us that it's doubled. Now, as I said last week, when we introduced the book of Job, with some background on and where Job lived, it was followed by a look at the two tests he was put through by Satan with the permission of God. So if you'd like to view this teaching, you can either go to our website, and this is the screen for it, uh, to thejesusmovement.com.au to watch the first video that's been recorded, or you can go to our YouTube channel, and I'll leave this up on the screen for a moment. If you type in Q-M96RXMTAW, and it will open up Job's first and second test from the first lesson. So that's there available uh, for you to watch. So we learnt in this first sermon how Satan in his first test had Job's oxen, donkeys and camels carried off by foreign raiding parties. His sheep were burnt alive, his servants were murdered and his children were in fact killed. In the second test, as we mentioned, Satan afflicted Job with sores so painful he took a piece of broken pottery to scrape his skin and his wife told him to curse God and die. But through it all, Job remained humble and continued to praise God. Today, we are going to open by reading from Job chapter 2, verses 11 to 13, to learn what happens when Job's three friends heard about his troubles. And so, if you turn your Bibles to Job chapter 2, we're going to read from verses 11 to 13. So I hope that bit of background has helped you if you've missed the first uh, message. And so we're going to read again from Job 2, verses 11 to 13. And it reads, When Job's three friends, Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuhite, and Zophar the Naamathite, heard about all the troubles that had come upon him, they set out from their homes and met together by agreement to go and sympathise with him and comfort him. They began to weep aloud, and they tore their robes and sprinkled dust on their heads. 
Then they sat on the ground with him for seven days and seven nights. No one said a word to him because they saw how great his suffering was. And so I'm going to open with a question today. In Job 1.20, he tore his robe and shaved his head. Here we learn that his three friends tore their robes and sprinkled dust on their heads. Why did Job and then his friends do this? So this has a biblical understanding behind it. Right, so they show the lowest of the low. What's what do people? Why do people tear their robes or put dust on their head, shave their heads, don sackcloths, those sort of things in the Bible? We read about this in the Old Testament. When they're mourning, mourning. When they're mourning, yeah. uh, is one of the main purposes, and we also learn about it. When they reveal the sin. When they sin, yeah. very good. So, for example, in the time of Nehemiah, if we look at that in the Bible, what do we have happen? He actually tore his clothes when he had news from his brother, Hanani, about what was going on in Jerusalem. And so what did he do? He tore his clothes, he put on sackcloth, he put ashes on his head. And the Bible tells us that he mourned, prayed and fasted for three months. And so this is a common practice, whether individually or corporately, if some, something or someone had sinned or were mourning, people would come beside them and do the same. And so we learn here, uh, we could call it in sympathy, uh, or we could look at it as empathy, which is a different point of view, that those friends that came to him, they decided that they would lower themselves, as you said, to his station And so we're going to have an exploration of this. So the next question I'm going to ask you is, the three friends didn't say a word to him for a week. Do you think that this was the right thing to do? Or would you handle it differently if you had a friend in need? Think about it. If something really terrible happened to someone, can you picture yourself going to them and then spending a week with them, but not speaking a word to them. Is this something that's the right thing to do, do you think? Or would you handle it differently? Sometimes um, I think people don't want to hear stuff. They just, they want the comfort that they're they're there. Right. So I think it probably did a a good thing. A lot of the times we speak, and we're not always saying what we should be saying. Right, right, very good. So sometimes what we're saying is we sometimes people speak but they're not saying what they should be saying. One of the things I've observed is when people have been passing away with cancer, that people come to visit them and they're weeping and they're sorrowful and they're mourning the person before they've even passed away. And so, they seek sympathy in their feelings and yet come into the presence of the person who needs empathy for their life. And so they fail to recognise that what they're actually doing is not helping the person but in fact causing a huge amount of consternation and making them feel very uncomfortable and in fact very unwanted, very unloved and in fact almost invisible because people are failing to meet their needs, they're only concerned with fulfilling their own. And so this is a common uh, issue. So Job chapter 2 verses 11 to 13 that we're just looking at, it gives us this account of the kind visit of Job's three friends. The news of his extraordinary troubles have obviously spread through the region, for he was an eminent man suffering under extraordinary circumstances. If we go to chapter 1, it actually says that he is the, the number one person in the east. So in other words, he's the most well-known person, the most prosperous, the most influential. You would assume he was also a very wise person if people saw him in this light. So we'll learn later that his enemies triumph in his calamities whilst his friends endeavour to comfort him. Now named Eliphaz, Bildad and Zophar, later in this series we're going to meet a fourth person called Elihu. So these three, as we will learn, are wise, prominent and good men who are very old and knowledgeable. 
Last week I spoke about the land of Uz being in the land of Aram, which we can determine from the table of nations in the book of Genesis. And so that's in the hill country of today's southwest Syria. I also spoke of why Job probably lived during the time of the patriarchs Abraham, Isaac or Jacob. And if we have a look at biblical genealogy this week, if we go to Genesis chapter 36 verses 10 to 11, we see that one of the three friends of Job, called Eliphaz the Temanite, is a son or a descendant of Teman. So Teman is actually listed there in Genesis 36, 10 to 11. He, in fact, is a grandson of Esau. And Esau, of course, is Jacob's brother. And so it gives us another alignment from the genealogy with the period of the patriarchs in which the story of Job is set. It also lets us know that to the east was a large region because the land of Edom is obviously down at the bottom of the Dead Sea and the, the location of Aram is above the Sea of Galilee. So that whole eastern region, he must have been well known. Now in Job 19, and we're not up to there yet, but I'll put the scripture up. In Job 19 verse 14, we learn how Job's relatives and friends forsook him when it says, when he said, my kinsmen have gone away, my friends have forgotten me. So my kinsmen means my relatives, my kin. So in other words, all of his family, his, his, his relations, he says, have gone away. And here he also says that my friends have forgotten me. Obviously he's got three friends who didn't forget him, <coughs> but obviously the greater number of friends who would consider them his friends have gone away. And so when his moment of trouble comes, we find that everybody abandons him apart from Eliphaz, Bildad and Zophar, who came and remained by his side. They came to mourn with him and comfort him. And as friends, they would normally come to share in his comforts because that's what they would have always done. But now in Job's moment of need, they came to share with him in his grief. So I'm going to ask Another question, what can we learn from this? What can we learn from their actions? That they came to be by his side, to mourn with him and comfort him. And as friends, in the moment of need, they came to share with him in his grief. What does it say about being friends with someone? True friends, not the sort of friends that do this. That disappear when something bad happens or they don't want to know about something difficult what does it say what should we be doing what do you think we should do you should make yourself available through all times not just the good times right very good we should make ourselves available through all times not just good times so by visiting and comforting those who are afflicted you have to realize that we too can contribute to their improvement and we can also learn from their troubles and receive instruction, wisdom and experience. And so we may look at it as a one-way situation where we go to be with somebody else in their moment of need and yes, we can certainly contribute to the improvement of their situation. However, at the same time, we get to experience something from the person that's being afflicted as well. We learn from their troubles. So in other words, what happened to them, why did it happen to them, becomes something which helps us to have instruction, wisdom and experience. And so if it happens to us, we may know better how to deal with it, or we may be able to help somebody else who goes through the same experience. And so these three friends of Job's are those three people so sometimes, simply by visiting someone in need, we can encourage them. The fact that they went and didn't speak means they probably, the depth of what happened to him, they have no words, they don't know what to say. But they show their solidarity with him and their love for him by simply visiting them. And that is an encouragement that they're not now on their own. Everybody hasn't abandoned them in their time of need. So an appropriate good word can be spoken to help them, but as Job's friends demonstrate, they didn't come to satisfy their curiosity with an account of his troubles, but to mourn, comfort, and mingle their tears with his. 
One of the things that often happens when people are suffering or have an affliction is people start comparing notes. You may notice this in conversation. Something happens to someone and someone will say, oh yes, that's like what happened to me. And then suddenly the focus has come completely off the person that you're there for and it becomes all about somebody participating in the group. And so this is a common thing that we actually see. People sometimes perhaps think that they're identifying with someone else by explaining that they have a situation that's the same. But a person who's suffering probably doesn't really want to hear about that situation at that point in time, so it's probably not very wise. And so these three men have the wisdom just to sit and comfort him. So we notice also from this scripture that Job's friends didn't come as a result of invitation. They heard and simply set out to visit him. In verse 11 that we've just read, it says that they met together in agreement. That means before they went to see Job and bound themselves together by appointment to not only do good, but to encourage and assist one another to do so. How often do we hear of circumstances when people suffer and then hear how no one visits them or helps them or comforts them because they have not been invited? One of the difficulties when we go to help someone sometimes is people suffer from a lack of bravery perhaps. They're not sure what to say, what to do. So they're not bold in that sense of the word and so often they don't go. However, these men, by coming together and making an agreement, they bound themselves to each other that no matter what's happening, they're going to go together. And so sometimes when we face something difficult, when we do it together, it's easier than we face it on our own. And so this story from Job shows that this is what's actually happening. So comments like, I wasn't invited, it's none of my business, or why should I help, are often what people will use when somebody's in trouble. They didn't call me, why should I help? Oh. I don't know what to do, why should I go? Oh, that's their business, that's private. I'm not gonna get involved. When in fact, everybody is doing that and nobody's getting involved and nobody's helping them. We've gotta remember that when people are having problems, they don't usually invite people in to their problems. They usually don't want people to know that they're having them. And so this is the case. We find with Job that he is suffering, but he didn't ask anyone to come by his side. So we must remember that, when, that we must have our heart in the right place if we are to help others. In the book of Philippians, in chapter 2, verse 4, it says, Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. And so the Lord tells us that we're not to go through life with tunnel vision, looking only at our own interests, but also to be aware of the interests of others. And so when there is a, an affliction or a dilemma, it's something that we are asked to help with. And then in Galatians chapter 6, verse 2, this emphasizes the point by saying to actually bear one another's burdens. And so fulfill the law of Christ. And so if you're wondering what you should do, this should make it abundantly clear. These three men came and spent a full week with him before they even spoke. They put themselves on the ground with him. They tore their robes with him. And so we can see from this that they were actually bearing the burden of Job. And so this is a very profound scripture and it tells us here that by so doing we are fulfilling the law of Christ. What law do you think we're fulfilling when we take on the burden of another person? Loving your neighbour as yourself. Right. Love one another as you love your neighbour. Absolutely. So you love your neighbour as you love one another. Wrong, wrong way around. But absolutely, it's very, very important. And so this is one of the two great new commandments that Jesus gave. He told us not to judge, and he told us to love one another. So notice 
Also, how Job's appearance had become so disfigured with sores, he had a shaven head and no robe, so when they went to him, they could barely recognize him. Grief can also disfigure your appearance immensely. So we're not talking about an affliction, we're talking about how we feel. It affects our appearance. People stop taking care of themselves. People stop worrying about being clean, for example. So when people become afflicted, their appearance also becomes afflicted. And this is another reason why other people will turn away from them. I have, I certainly have experience with this, but I've asked here, have you ever had an experience when a dirty, a drunken or a drug affected person has tried to attend church? Did everyone treat them the same as a well-dressed and clean person? Do people consider that someone's circumstances doesn't always reflect their character? And don't we all experience difficulties beyond our control at some point in our lives? There was a video that was going around last year on Facebook that showed a pastor who had taken over a new church in America, a congregation of 5,000 people. And he decided the first day that he went there that he would go in a state that made him look like a street beggar. So he was disheveled, he was dirty, and his clothes were filthy. When he tried to enter the church, he was asked not to. When they finally let him, they told him it's okay, but he has to sit at the back. And so people would walk in and they would turn up their nose at him. Not one person actually spoke to him out of 5,000 members. So the time came when the pastor who was leaving announced the new pastor whom had arrived and of course everyone in the church peered forwards to the front of the church to see who this person was only to find that the man at the back stood up and walked down the center aisle to their dismay as they all realized that they had been rude to him ignored him and judged him when he got up on the stage people were silent they didn't know what to say and so he said a few words to teach them a lesson about what it was to be a Christian person and then he dismissed them from the service and said we're going to start again next week and so what he showed through that one experience was all these people who've been attending church for all these years and the outgoing pastor that their values were just not where they should be when they had somebody in need, they didn't come by their side. In fact, they didn't want them in their presence amongst them as good Christians dressed nicely. And so there's a huge lesson in this for all of us. So the glory of God's servant, Job, had become stained and sullied, but God equipped his friends just as he has with you and I not to leave a person in need because of being frightened by them or loathing them. In verse 12 of chapter 2, it says that Eliphaz, Bildad and Zophar wept aloud, tore their robes and sprinkled dust on their heads. They didn't look down upon Job in pity or sympathy. They stripped themselves and abased themselves in empathy to share his grief. Okay. So when they abased themselves and stripped themselves, they made themselves like him. They didn't stand above him saying, oh, you poor thing. In verse 13, it says that they sat on the ground with him for seven days and seven nights. And as I say, I don't know about you, but these men are really setting a high benchmark for compassion, love and mercy of a friend. They humble themselves to share in his grief and poverty just as they had shared with him previously in his joy and prosperity. They didn't just look on him and leave. They didn't just pray for him and leave. But they shared in his misery and resolved themselves to stay with him no matter how long that it took. So my question to you is, why do you think the three friends didn't say a word? Now, we have sort of touched on this for a week. 
is there anything more that I said since my initial question that you can think of? Why do you think the three th the three friends didn't say a word to Job for a week? Um, I think in them days, wasn't it customary to not say anything for a week? But um, well, they do have mourning periods, mourning period. and they do have laws around this. But this is before the time of the laws of Moses, okay. and so so they don't apply. Um, but yes, there was a time, but not before the laws of Moses. The thing is, is that what they were saying nothing to him because they didn't want to actually say something which would cause him to grieve further. Okay, Because they could see how great his grief already was. So there is actually a time for all of us to realise that it's better just to be silent. By their long silence, think about it, seven days and seven nights, they also convey what they were going to say afterwards was well considered and the result of much thought. In other words, you spend seven days and nights with someone and you refrain from saying anything, obviously those three people are probably looking at one another, they're having thoughts about what's going on, they're processing what they want to say. So all of those things are going on whilst there's a silence. They're assuming also that Job's silence is because he's grieving. So this is a perspective, if you will, a point of view. So I have this point of wisdom for you. And it says that the heart of a wise person first studies and considers what they say before they answer. So first study, so that means that we spend time on it and considers what they say, so we consider the outcome of what we've studied before we actually give an answer. We all know that if we're quick to speak sometimes, we say things that we shouldn't say because they often are based on emotions or reactions and there is no wisdom in it. So as we have this phrase, we should think twice and speak once, especially in such a case as this. So think long and you'll be better able to speak short and to the point. So we're now going to go to Job chapter 3, and we're going to read all of the verses from 1 to 26, so it's the full chapter of Job, and then I will give an explanation for how this is structured. So if you open your Bibles to chapter 3, verses 1 to 26. And it reads, After this, Job opened his mouth and cursed the day of his birth. He said, May the day of my birth perish and the night that said, A boy is conceived. That day may it turn to darkness May God above not care about it. May no light shine on it. May gloom and utter darkness claim it once more. May a cloud settle over it. May blackness overwhelm it. That night, may thick darkness seize it. May it not be included among the days of the year, nor be entered in any of the months. May that night be barren. May no shout of joy be heard in it. May those who curse days curse that day, those who are ready to rouse Leviathan. Now Leviathan, just as a subnote, is actually a description in Hebrew for a sea serpent. So akin to a large fish or a monster of the ocean. Uh, reading on verse 9, May its morning stars become dark, may it wait for daylight in vain and not see the first rays of dawn. For it did not shut the doors of the womb on me to hide trouble from my eyes. Why did I not perish at birth and die as I came from the womb? Why were there knees to receive me and breasts that I might be nursed? For now I would be lying down in peace, I would be asleep and at rest with kings and rulers of the earth, who built for themselves places now lying in ruins, with princes who had gold who filled their houses with silver. Or well, why was I not hidden away in the ground like a stillborn child, 
like an infant who never saw the light of day. There the wicked cease from turmoil, and there the weary are at rest. Captives also enjoy their ease. They no longer hear the slave drivers shout. The small and the great are there, and the slaves are freed from their owners. Why is light given to those in misery and life to the bitter of soul, to those who long for death that does not come, who search for it more than for hidden treasure, who are filled with gladness and rejoice when they reach the grave? Why is life given to a man whose way is hidden, whom God has hedged in? For sighing has become my daily food, my groans pour out like water. What I feared has come upon me, what I dreaded has happened to me. I have no peace, no quietness, I have no rest, but only turmoil. Well, what a joy that is. (laughs) Uh, The three men have sat with him for seven days and seven nights, and then this is what he utters. And so I'm going to explain to you how this is broken up into three components of what he's speaking about. So in verses 1 to 10, Job complains because he was born. So the focus of all of that is about him being born. In verses 11 to 19, Job complains because he did not die as soon as he was born. So he moves uh, to a different um, stage. And then in verses 20 to 26, Job complains because his life now continued when he is in misery. And so we have these three distinct phases when he was born, not dying as soon as he was born, and then continuing on in life even though he is miserable. And so when you, if you go back and you cast your eyes over those sections, you'll realise that they have those three distinct phases. Now, contrary to the two tests that Job suffers at the hand of Satan in chapters 1 and 2, we learn here that Job sins with his lips. You may notice in the first and the second test, the scripture said, but Job didn't sin. Everything that happened to him, but he didn't sin. But here, after seven days and seven nights of silence, he opens his mouth And he sins with his lips. Why do you think he's sinning with what he's saying? What is a sin with what he's saying? Any ideas? Start with the first opening verse. After this, Job opened his mouth and cursed the day of his birth. Is a curse a sin? Okay, does God want us to curse even our own birthday. Isn't that the day that God gave life to us? And so he continues on talking about how um, he, he would prefer to be dead and how great it would be to be lying quiet in a grave. Do you think this is what God wants for us? Definitely not. Now we just finished a series prior to this one on the book of James in which we looked at what James said in our fifth sermon about taming the tongue. And so if we reflect on that, we see here that Job needs to tame his tongue because he's saying things in his grief that perhaps he doesn't really believe. He's responding to his emotions and he's responding to his circumstances, but he's speaking in a very self-pitying fashion. So this should be a warning for us to take note of. In fact, if we look at verses 1 to 10, if you read them and cast your eye over them now, you realise that each of them begin with the word may. And it says it 14 times. May the day of my birth perish. May it turn to darkness. May God above not care. May no light light shine it. May gloom and utter darkness. May a cloud settle over it. May blackness and so on. And so when he says may, he is cursing. Okay? May this bad thing happen. May that bad thing happen. May this come against me. May that be darkness. These are all curses. And so that first segment of verses 1 to 10, 
he is essentially cursing his whole way through. And so we must take notice of this. Okay, so we're going to look at these in three section title sections. So the first one, as I just mentioned, verses 1 to 10, we're going to look at Job, Job complains because he was born. Do you think Job was complaining about being born before this happened to him? No. He was clearly an eminent and wealthy man, and so suddenly something goes wrong, and he complains about the day that he was born. It sort of sets the tone, doesn't it? So during Job's seven days of silence, it's actually revealed from what he says now that in fact his heart was on fire. So much so that when he does speak, his tongue unleashes curse after curse, and in fact 14 of them as I've counted there. His friends had sat thinking and refrained from saying anything because they were afraid of saying what they thought in case they caused Job to grieve. Whilst the whole time they thought that Job was mourning, he had refrained from saying anything to vent his thoughts so he wouldn't offend them. Suddenly, the outlook changes, doesn't it? It would have been better if Job had kept his thoughts to himself. Can you imagine these men waited seven days and then he comes out with this? There's no thank you. There's no, <laughs> there's no compassion. There's no, there's no uh, sharing of loss about... You know, I love my kids or any of this sort of stuff. It's just out with this cursing. So to put this in perspective, he cursed his birthday, the fact that he was born and could not think or speak of his own birth without regret and anger. People normally rejoice their birthdays, but Job looked on it as the unhappiest day of the year and his life because it was the means by which suffering entered into his life so that's what he's cursing if he hadn't have been born then this wouldn't have happened so how quickly has Job forgotten the good that he was born into he had led a life full of privilege wealth and success and as quickly as calamity stuck he became filled with thoughts of evil and a wish to never be born but Job is not on his own and so I'm going to bring an example from the prophet Jeremiah when he experienced calamities in his life, he too spoke a similar language. And this just opens the door to all examples in our lives and in the past throughout the Bible as well. So if we go to Jeremiah chapter 5 verse 10, so 15 verse 10, it reads, Alas, my mother, that you gave me birth, a man with whom the whole land strives and contends. I have neither lent nor borrowed, yet everyone curses me. So this is Jeremiah speaking. Alas, my mother, that you gave me birth, a man with whom the whole land strives and contends. I have never lent nor borrowed, yet everyone curses me. So this tells you of a time that the people who were normally cursed are those who are lending money and creating debt that people had to pay back, tax collectors and so on. And so here, he speaks about the same thing, but the language is the same as what Job is using. And then again in Jeremiah chapter 20, verses 14 to 15, Jeremiah says, Cursed be the day I was born. So same thing. Cursed be the day I was born. May the day my mother bore me not be blessed. Cursed be the man who brought my father the news, who made him very glad, saying, a child is born to you, a son. That scripture does continue through another couple of verses, uh, by the way, but I've just put that portion up because it emphasizes how he says, Cursed be the day I was born. So how fickle and how quick do people change when adversity strikes? This is the question. When everything's okay... People rattle along, but as soon as something gets upset, they change dramatically. Blessed and anointed men of God, we see here in the Bible, turn on God's blessings and curse themselves and others when calamity strikes. Jeremiah was anointed by God to be his prophet, to be his messenger. And yet when, some, when he's, he's struggling because of what comes against him, he curses the day that he was born. Not very godly. If we understand when we are conceived, we are born into a life of sin, 
we must also understand that when our time comes to die, we are actually free of the flesh and the impact that sin has on us. So in other words, our death should look like something that's better than our birth. As believers, going to eternal life, we're going to something better and we've left something that's worse behind. We are born with great joy, but the reality is we're born into a life of sin because we are of the flesh. But if you curse the day of your birth because you experience calamity in your life, then it's like arguing with God for the very miracle of your life and indulging in self-pity. Self-pity is a sin because it places yourself first. So we don't accept what God has given to us. So it's both shameful and a sin. There is no condition that you can find yourself in that excuses you from honouring God. You need to work out your salvation and be happy with your life, no matter what your circumstances are. You must own it, for there is another life after this, and if you let your sorrows and troubles get in your way and say you were made in vain, then you jeopardise the very opportunity God gave you for eternal life. We have to take the good with the bad. It's that simple. There are those who have gone to hell who would wish they had never been born. One I can think of would be Judas, the disciple of Jesus, right? who accepted the money as a, as a bribe to say where he was. But on this side of hell, there can be no reason for such a vain and ungrateful wish. Job was foolish and he was weak to curse his birthday. Whilst we condemn Job for cursing his birth, it still remains that the outcome of Satan's actions are still not as bad as he expected. Remember what the whole purpose of this story is. What did Satan, he challenged God, remember? So he said, I'm going to do all this stuff to Job and there's going to be an outcome and that's that Job would curse God. And so even all of this is happening and he speaks all of this terrible invective he still doesn't curse God. That remains outside of what he says. So he's weary of life and would happily part with it, as he says here, but he is not weary of God, nor did he let his faith go. The dispute between God and Satan was not whether Job had infirmities and afflictions or whether he was subject to the same passions as we are, but whether he was a hypocrite who secretly hated God and if provoked would show his hatred. Satan's purpose was to provoke Job, who was well loved by God, in order for him to curse him. But he doesn't. But even with his suffering at the trial inflicted by Satan and allowed by God, Job proved that he was no such man through his actions and through his words, in fact. Although Job speaks poorly with his lips, we will see later how he repents and condemns himself for his impatience, and through his actions God doesn't condemn him. So we too must learn from this. If you act out of haste, you must repent for your actions or words, and watch carefully over what you say and what you do in the future. So in other words, we need to learn and change. Okay, so the second component of this scripture from verses 11 to 19. We said that Job complained because he did not die as soon as he was born. And so when we, when we have a look at this, Job's folly, sorry, Job follows his folly in wishing he had never been born with another little better wish that he had died as soon as he was born. So it's almost like he goes through these gradations, isn't it? He goes from cursing the day when he's born to saying uh, that he wished he'd died when he was born because the fact is he's been born. And then the next stage he goes to saying, why should I keep living because I'm miserable? So those three phases. So Jesus blesses the barren womb, but here Job curses the fruitful womb. He's been born and yet he curses it. Job absurdly complains of life as a curse and covets death and the grave as his greatest and most desirable bliss. 
Satan really got it wrong in Job 2.4, which I'll put on the screen, when he said, A man will give all he has for his own life. A man will give all he has for his own life. But he didn't give all, did he? Because he didn't curse God. This remains through the story of Job. In this instance, Job never, uh, there, was another, there wasn't another man in the Bible who valued life at a lower rate than Job did. As Satan said, a man will give all he has for his own life. Job didn't give it all. Now in verses 11 to 19, in the second section, Job ungratefully quarrels with life and is angry that it was not taken from him as soon as it was given to him. Job describes what a weak and helpless creature man is when he comes into the world. In verse 11, he says we are ready to die as we come from the womb. In verse 12, he says we can do nothing for ourselves but drop into the grave if the mother's knees do not prevent us and her breasts do not feed us. And so he's saying there's nothing in between. In verses 13 to 19, Job passionately applauds death and the grave. If your desire to die is to be with Christ and free from sin, then this is what we call the evidence of grace. But if your desire to die is only so you can be quiet and delivered from the trouble in this life, you have a problem. In Romans 14, verse 8, it says, If we live, we live for the Lord, and if we die, we also die for the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. Job is speaking in such a way that he's seemingly making a choice between the two. He would prefer to die because then he doesn't have to face the troubles which the Lord has allowed to be bestowed upon him. It is our duty to make the best of life. Job thinks if he died when he was born and was carried to the grave, he would be with the best. What a strange thought. If you look at verses 14 to 15, he says he will be with the kings and counsellors of the earth. But the reality is the worms get them too. Even they die and just simply return to dust. In verse 16, Job says a stillborn child lies soft and easy. And in verse 17, when the persecuted die, they can no longer be troubled. So he's justifying why it would be good to lie still in the grave and be dead. Should this have been true, Job would never have actually experienced what he experienced. That's the reality. The, the Sabians and Chaldeans who took his livestock wouldn't have been there to take his livestock. He wouldn't have existed. And none of his enemies would have caused him any trouble because he wouldn't have been there. But we must be very clear here that a grave may be a rest for our physical bodies, but heaven and hell will be more than a rest for our souls. This is what we have to understand, the philosophical aspect of what we're looking at here when we're trying to rationalise things for ourselves, is that we think when we're dead that we have peace, it's all done. But it's not. Because next comes heaven or hell. In either case, you're not going to be having a restful soul. And so this is something which we need to understand. Job can't speak into being peace through saying that he's going to lie in a grave or be stillborn. In Revelation, the book of Revelation, chapter 14, verse 13, it says, Then I heard a voice from heaven say, Right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, they will rest from their labor, for their deeds will follow them. So in other words, when our bodies passed away, the flesh 
there is no more physical labour. And so, yeah, they'll rest from their labour. However, the actions of that person throughout their life, their deeds will follow them. It can go to two different places where it's going to follow. One will be heaven and one will be hell. The sort of teaching we don't hear about anymore. So Job's lesson is very important to us. In verses 17 and 18, Job says slaves will be freed from their masters. Why? Because death is the discharge of prisoners. No more insults, no more being trampled on, no one being menaced and terrified by taskmasters. In summary, all mankind are going to be levelled by death. Whether the conqueror or the slave, the wise or the foolish, the coward or the brave, once dead, we lie undistinguished in the grave. Man puts all different types of headstones and tombstones and grave sites and, you know, uh, what do you call it, these, these chambers where people are put within. But the person inside doesn't partake of any of that. It is only for people who visit in the flesh. The reality is, once you're dead, your body will decompose the same as anybody else's. So Job's wish to perish at birth is nothing but folly. And so when he speaks of this, he's being very foolish. Okay, now the third portion of this scripture and the final portion is that Job complains because his new life continued in misery. So we're going to look now at verses 20 to 26. So having first cursed his life from the day he was born, then questioning why he did not perish at birth, Job now courts the day of his death and complains that his life continues without being cut off. <clears throat> we'll talk about this a bit in the moment because this is quite a big issue for people today as well. In verses 20 to 22, Job thinks it is hard for those who suffer miserable lives to be prolonged. He complains of bitterness of the soul, a form of spiritual grievance that makes life bitter. Okay. When Job speaks of light in verse 20, he says, Why is light given to those in misery? He's talking about God. Satan said to God in Job 2 verse 5 that Job will curse you to your face. Job, however, does not. What Job does say here reflects on the question, why does God continue the life of someone when their comforts are removed? And so today we live in a time where countries have legalized euthanasia. And so when people are miserable, people say, I have the right to terminate my life on my terms. This is nothing to do with God. Okay? And so when people convince other people to be compassion, compassionate and to aid them to kill themselves, they're committing a very grave sin. And so this sows into this issue. Biblically, life is represented by light and death is represented by darkness. So this light is given to us by God. If you want to look at life and think about how it is, it's like a candle. The longer it burns, the shorter it becomes. So in other words, the longer we live, the shorter the remainder of our life will be. And like a candle, it is renewed like a daily gift. When a candle runs out, we replace it and we light it again. It runs out, we replace it and light it again. This is akin to us waking up every morning and God giving us another day of light. We have to recognize this. Job reckons for those in misery, they are better without the light for it only serves to show them their own misery. And so he's bent on this, this um, understanding about being miserable. There are those among us who long for death when they have outlived their comforts and usefulness and are burdened with age, 
common comment of the aged is I don't want to live anymore, there's no quality of life, they're ill, pain, sickness, poverty, or in fact disgrace. People start vocalising their desire not to be living anymore. And yet, it doesn't come. At the same time, death comes to those who dread it, who don't want it. Many people die who don't want to die. And so we've got people who have life who are wishing to die, and those who wanted to have life find themselves dead. And so when we look at this, we must realise that the continuity and length of our lives can only be according to God's will, not our own. In verse 23, Job sees no way of bettering his situation for his way is, it says, hidden and hedged in by God. He can see no path for deliverance and doesn't know what course to take. He speaks out of self-pity, which again is a sin he engages in when he speaks. So he started off in this passage cursing, sinning, and he finishes off this passage sinning when he speaks out of self-pity. He thinks of himself as being dealt with harshly, and why should he continue to live a life that now only appears to be filled with pain and suffering? He clearly believes his pain and misery won't ease unless death comes his way. And so we can see here that people are deciding whether life is worth living based on their circumstances, rather than it being a gift from God. When so many craved life or being able to give birth to a child, it is so ungrateful to God, the giver of life, to indulge in our own sinful inconsideration for our future. As believers, it is our duty to prepare for eternal life, but it is up to God to decide when it is time, not us. And so I have a point here for you on grace. It's quite profound, I believe. Grace teaches us in the midst of life's greatest comforts to be willing to die. When we have everything, we don't want to die. And in the midst of life's greatest tribulations, to be willing to live. And so when people have much, they're not willing to die. When people have little, they want to die. And so God's grace is not about that. God's grace is about being willing to live even though our circumstances may be coming against us. The story of Job is very, very clear here that this is a message about grace. He is failing to see God's grace in this situation. He's not cursing God. He's failing to see God's grace in his life at this point in time. He sees everything having been removed from him and so he's not willing to live. He speaks he doesn't want to stay. When he was wealthy, I wonder whether he would have been willing to die. He would have wanted to hang around for a while and enjoy it a bit. And so this message of grace is very important. So in talking to his friends, Job tries to excuse himself with his earnest desire to die and pleads that the little comfort and satisfaction he has left in life will not sustain him. In verse 24, Job speaks of having no comfort in his life, even saying he has no appetite for food. His pain comes out as groans that pour out like water. And finally, in verses 25 and 26, Job reveals that even when he was prosperous, he feared that he would lose everything. And so you read this story and you think, well, this is all about the fact that he's lost everything. But if we actually read really carefully, we see that there's another side to this. He hadn't been negligent or unmindful of his affairs, but his fear of trouble caused him to maintain his guard. 
How can we know this? So one example comes from Job chapter 1 verse 5. It says that he was afraid for his children when they were feasting in case they offended God. Why would he be afraid? So this tells you that he's not at peace, he's not secure, he's not in control, and he recognises that even though he is wealthy and prosperous. He was also afraid for his servants in case they offended his neighbours, and he took great care of his health and managed himself in his affairs with all possible precaution. And so we find that Job, in reflection, was a person who wasn't without worry and wasn't without care. He was concerned that things could go wrong. So to conclude today, Job had never been secure nor indulged himself in ease and softness. He had not trusted in his wealth nor flattered himself, yet trouble still came to him. For this reason, his way was hidden. He didn't know what to do nor why God would let this happen to him. Job had three good friends who waited patiently for seven days before he spoke. But he not only spoke, he broke. He cursed and complained and when put under pressure, his lips spoke of sin. But to his credit, he never faltered in his faith nor did he curse God. It is now that Job learns it is futile to aggravate his grief and with time he will learn how to alleviate it. This is the journey of the book of Job. As it is for Job, it is incumbent upon each of us to do our duty in our days of prosperity, but at the same time we must not be so worldly to believe that trouble will not come our way. And I'm sure I can speak for all of us that are here, and I'm sure for everyone who's listening online, that that is very much the story of life. There always comes times when trouble comes our way, and it's how we handle it that matters. So we're just going to draw to a close on that note, and I'm just going to give thanks to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you today for this message of Job, Lord. Lord, when we examine your scripture and the heart behind the hand that wrote it, we see that there is always much more in the detail than we may first realize. Understanding Job's perspective says much about life and teaches us that we are to value life no matter what circumstances we live in or what circumstances come against us. Lord, I just pray today that for, for anyone who is suffering, who perhaps is cursing you or is cursing life or is cursing the day that they were born, born or wish that they were dead or say they don't understand why they have to live their life in misery, I pray that these words will help and touch their hearts and realize how precious every drop of life is. Lord, it is you who gives life and it is you who takes it away. So today we submit ourselves under your authority. We submit ourselves to our life's journey and we say thanks for everything that we have. Lord, when times of trouble come our way, may you place friends and touch their hearts to come, to be around us, to assist us, to comfort us, and to be with us in our moments of need. May you grant wisdom to all of us when we come beside someone in their moments of need. May we have empathy and not sympathy. May we never walk away from somebody because of their appearance or their history or their circumstances. You created all men equal in your eyes, Lord. You don't see the outer garments. Help us too to see the person within 
and not the outer garments, Lord. Help us to be compassionate. Help us to fulfill Jesus' laws of loving thy neighbour, no matter whom our neighbour is. Lord, thank you for today. Thank you that we are able to share your word, both here in our local community as well as online. We thank you for this message. We pray that it touches hearts and we give this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Well, thank you for joining us. I'm just going to put up this uh, end screen. Uh, we've been broadcasting live on Facebook and you can replay and watch that there on Facebook. Uh, it's also recorded on a high definition camera. And so this video will be uh, put up onto our YouTube channel. Uh, with all of the references that uh, you see on the screen behind. Uh, if you type in Paul Brunson, the Jesus Movement, you can subscribe there and enjoy the videos, receive an email notification as each new message is released, or you can go to our website on thejesusmovement.com.au and enjoy the same videos. So thank you for your company. God bless you, and we look forward to next time. Truly satisfied